Welcome to the Writer's Block Podcast. I'm writer Polly Roberts, and every episode I will be in conversation with another Cornwall-based writer, discussing process, why we write, and the part Cornwall plays in our work. I hope you find some wisdom and inspiration in what you hear. The Writer's Block is a creative writing centre for Cornwall. With innovation and creativity at our heart, we offer both a place to write and a unique approach to developing confidence and skills in writing for everyone. Pascal Petit is a French and Welsh poet now living in Cornwall. She has had four poetry collections shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize, and her latest collection, Tiger Girl, was shortlisted for the Forward Prize and Wales Book of the Year. Her last collection, Mama Amazonica, won the inaugural Laurel Prize and the Society of Literature's Ondaatje Prize. Her work explores themes of identity and personal stories among rich natural imagery, and she is described as very much a poet of the environment. I hope you enjoy what you hear. Hi, Pascal, and welcome to our podcast. We're really happy to have you along. It feels like a real privilege to to have you joining us from the writer's block because we've all heard so much about you. And in fact, I've seen you read a couple of times and I did a workshop with you actually when I was doing my master's. But um, but you live up Bodmin Way and we're down Red Ruth Way. <laughs> and so actually coinciding hasn't really happened for us yet as an organisation and a, a writer. So it's lovely to have you along. Oh, th- thank you for inviting me, Polly. <laughs> And you were just saying to me that you, you moved down to Cornwall seven years ago, is that right? Yes, yes. Um, I, I used to live in East London, in Walthamstow, and so I, I was near the marshes there. So there, there was a touch of wilderness there, um, <laughs> because that's my inspiration usually. Mm, I can really relate to that. Yeah, I used to live um Stamford Hill and I would get on my bike almost every single day and cycle out to the marshes because I just needed a little injection of nature. So I'm kind of in awe that you managed to last decades like that if if inspiration comes from nature for you. Yes, well, I've always um, written from travels. and uh, But I, I have written about Paris, which is the city of my birth. Um, right. But only by um, mingling Paris with the Amazon rainforest or something like that. <laughs> Amazing. Where do, where do the environments come to you then? Because I, I'm so curious, each of your collections is very rich in, in often like a particular environment. And so how, how is it that you find which environment you're going to be writing through? Mm. I don't know. I can only talk about a particular instance, I think. Uh, So if if I talk about uh, how I started Mama Amazonica, my seventh collection, um, I wrote a poem imagining my mother as the giant Victoria Amazonica lily. And I just knew when I did that, that I, I could write more, that there, there was a whole, there was the whole um, new mother to make in the Amazon rainforest. Mm, so right. um, so that's how it happened, really. So, so then eventually I'd been to the Amazon twice already, but quite a long time ago I'd been to the Venezuelan Amazon, to the Lost right. World, which is more cloud forests than... Um, lowland primary forest and so then eventually as I was writing Mama Amazonica uh, I went to the Peruvian Amazon twice and kind of spent time in a very pristine national park Tambopata National Park Mm. and uh, so yeah so, so the poem that title poem which was Mama Amazonica led to all the rest and led to the travels right wow so is that often the way it goes I mean do you know oh I think I'm at the start of a collection when you write a particular poem or 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 does it often yeah yeah, not not always no um I have in in a few instances um 
I know when I wrote The Zoo Father, that came yeah. after a long period of a block, after my father contacted me after 35 years wow. vanishing. Uh, and I had a total block when I went to visit him. I couldn't write about the reality of it. Mm. And then one day I went to the little zoo in the Jardin des Plantes and I wrote a poem called The Zoo Father, which never lasted. There never is a poem in the book called The Zoo Father. But in but actually in each stanza there was a portrait of him or myself as one of the animals in and they happened to have Amazonian animals in the zoo. Yeah. So that's what started it. And then I knew ah this is the way to go Mm. and this is how I can write about him because yes writing about the the mundanity of his room didn't work for me yeah yeah that's really interesting that the kind of how the images that come out how you find a way to to speak about something because you use such rich imagery in your poetry and and place is just such a huge part of it and so yeah it feels to me as though you're you're finding the voices to to talk about the personal issues or the political issues through rather than kind of going directly there yeah yeah Yeah. so it's like filters Mm. um which change what 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 was actual and uh make it not just bearable to write about but uh, enjoyable Mm. pleasurable to write about because I'm writing about things that I love yes forests tigers jaguars and and so on gosh that's so interesting (laughs) is that that's I'm kind of almost imagining a meeting point between the therapeutic process of writing perhaps that the personal that needs processing or is asking to kind of have a bit of creative attention but then also that that passion and joy of writing, the going to the places you love and just melding the two together. Does that feel about mm. right? Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's quite complicated. Uh, yes. <laughs> process. Um, in a way, when something astounding happens to me, like my father appearing or my need to change my relationship, very bad relationship with my mother, and create a a book where I love her. Um, The, almost the the kind of um, intensity of the primary relationship, if you like, gives me a way of writing about the natural world in a very passionate way, which Mm. is possibly what I'm actually after. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, actually, there's a really strong urge from you to portray something about the natural world, to portray some message that you hear from yeah. it. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And I know you're, yeah, you're at, uh, yeah, keep going. I was just going to say that that really kind of started oh, quite a long time ago, in 1990, I think, when the first time I went to Scotland and climbed a little mountain um, on on the west coast, northwest mm. coast, uh, and I had an incredibly strong feeling that the mountain was alive and was watching. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think it all really came from there. And I suppose around that time, the Gaia hypothesis happened. Uh, James Lovelock's hypothesis, which then become, became a theory that um, the Earth is a living organism. Yeah. And it, it just really, something that I, it became an urgent thing for me to write about wow. somehow. Yeah. Wow. Something, yeah, it's, and, and that's followed you through all this time. You never get yes. bored. <laughs> yes. No, no, you you can't get bored with the natural world. I mean, it's just full of awe and wonder, really. And it, it's more how to speak about it in a fresh way, really. Mm. And, and which and you do describe, so well. Yeah. well <laughs> I'm absolutely you. amazed, honestly. I mean, 
I'm trying to remember which of your poems it was. I think it was the green bee eater, but also the poem you wrote about Bodmin Moor for AONB that I just thought, how have you come up mm. with unique oh. ways to talk about things that <laughs> are actually, you know, particularly that Bodmin poem, you know, we've talked about the Bodmin bee, so many people have written about it and you found all oh. these unique ways to approach it. Yeah. And I just wondered, how do wow, you keep that yes. fresh? Mm, um, well, when I first moved here, I was interested in going for walks in the forests and by the rivers. Uh, and I found the moor rather bleak and windy yeah. <laughs> and cold. <clears throat> so I wasn't that interested in the moor at first. Uh, and then I think COVID happened and I couldn't travel. I couldn't mm. go. I mean, in any case, travel became a dubious uh, exercise. Um, but I couldn't go to India and look for leopards. So I did start then investigating our very local um, tour, which is Kilmar Tour, which is a really beautiful. Uh, it, it, as someone said to me, it's, it's like it's like um, the back of a dragon or something, oh. the spine of a dragon. <laughs> um, and so I regularly would go, go up there. And so eventually I was doing research and finding out more and more about the beast of Bodmin. And I was, you know, and, and I wanted a, a, I wanted this beast to, to exist, but uh, they'd kept, keep being articles in, in newspapers in, from the past um, about it being a fake or, you know, and... Yeah. Um, but but an awful lot of farmers and people say actually that it did exist. So, so yeah. So then I, I started writing the Beast of Bodmin, and then then I you know I was commissioned, and it's quite good to be commissioned to write something because it kind of makes you. Yes. It gives you the subject, so I do like that. Yeah. And yeah, and and, and then and, and then I kept going to different parts of the moor as well, and so the poem grew. Mm. And it seems that every time I go, I see something new. Oh, There's wow. the uh, incredible bog that's between Beera Tor and Kilmar Tor with, it, with its um, drosphora, sundews and orchids. Oh, gosh. Um, uh, and lo lots of wonderful plants. Um, um, and then there's a waterhole, which is very hard to see from any distance. You have to be right up to it. And the way the horses came to that, or one day a big black bull kind of um, growled and poured the ground <gasps> while his while his cows, his harem bathed. Oh, wow. Um, so I wrote about <laughs> that as well. <laughs> so it's almost, it's striking me like that the new environments bring the new language to you it's almost like they have their own yeah. unique stories so that that freshness yes. you just see it there it, I mean your eyes are open yeah, to it, it it's yeah it's partly the newness mm -hmm. and also I've noticed that I always have to go to a place uh like I've been to the Venezuelan Amazon twice right I've been to Angel Falls twice I climbed Mount Roraima once. I will never do it again. It was really hard for me. <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, and I've been to the Peruvian Amazon twice, and I've been to India twice to look for tigers. So um, so I, I like a, an immersion. I like yeah. the depth and yeah, okay. the opening out and, and discovering more. Mm. So, I, so I quite like repeating myself, in mm. fact, but but doing it in a different way. Yeah, I can really relate to that, actually. For me, and I'm curious if it is the same for you, the travel is has always been quite a big instigator of, of my creative writing. And, and there have been times when I haven't been able to travel, like you mentioned with COVID, for example, where, where it's felt a little bit like, oh, gosh, actually, I didn't realise quite how much I, I took this is the the place that I write, the way that I write, what I write from. But there is something to the repetition as well, to to the immersion, not just seeing something pass, but actually going to a new place, getting that fresh view and then staying there and embedding for a little bit and letting it kind of drop deeper into our psyche 
and yeah mm. Mm. yeah and just it's like going into the roots and mm. um almost kind of opening yourself up mm. and learning new ways of looking really and Beautiful. um of absorbing what's you know the strange thing that it is that's surrounding us this planet you know yes <laughs> I like that word strange and I'm wondering if the kind of draw to nature is the strangeness because you, you were saying before we started talking on the podcast about how you'd lived in London for decades but never written about London and I know for me I'm mostly a, a nature writer as well and I, I, yeah, I found it interesting how much I tend to draw to if I'm writing about people it's often through nature rather than writing about a cityscape or civilization. and it's not that I'm not interested in people but I wonder if it's something about the strangeness of the natural world that allows for the the writing to come through in a different way to the familiarity mm, of mm. people yeah I, I I I do think you know it's the planet is strange I, d I don't know what it is yeah. uh I don't think any of us really know <laughs> what it is and uh so so it's kind of a, a life's work to kind of try to make little inroads into it and and wonder, just wonder and think, what what is this, and why why you know why are there tigers? I mean, I know the simple answer is, you know, a, a food chain that <clears throat> they eat the deer and and the, the wild boar and <laughs> and yeah. all that, but it isn't the whole answer. Why why mm. are they so beautiful, you know, as well as <laughs> dangerous? <laughs> wow. Yes, yeah. I mean it's it's great to just bring that curiosity to everything that um I was gonna say childlike, but I, I don't mean that in a patronizing way, just that that freshness again, that that ability to just look at things and go, hang on a second, why? Look at the wonder here. And and you mm. really capture all of your poetry captures this sense of wonder. And oh, then the fact that you bring in you. these human themes, I think, helps bring a kind of wonder to the wildness in ourselves as well, mm. which, which, yeah. Yeah, because in a way we're, we're reflecting what's there. Yeah. You know, maybe we're a mirror for it. I don't know. Um, mm. Or maybe it's a mirror for us. Who knows? But, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, I know you're you're doing a. I think you're leading a course for the Dark Mountain Project this year. Is that? Oh yes. Oh, I'm not leading the course. I'm I'm a guest okay. reader. You're a guest. Okay, guest yes, reader. I'm the guest Have you reader. worked with them before? Is that um, because um, they're? Yeah. I, I I've uh, I've done a reading and talk with Tom before. Right. Yes. Um, yeah. But I, I haven't actually worked worked with them before. So, and does it? How is it? Because they they are so much about pooling writers that have this interest in the part mm. that creative writing can play in mm. in the current mm. environmental situation that we sit within. And how does yeah. it feel to to be joining in with that? Well, it was it's lovely to be invited. And yeah. to to be with Jay as well, and mm. um, you know they're they're both wonderful writers. Um, yeah, and it it just seems to me that a lot of people don't realise just how precarious our situation is, and yeah. the the planet situation. So, um, so it's re really good that there's this course and. And that yeah. the three of us can kind of chat to people about mm. it. Is that a hope that you have sometimes through your work that you might draw attention to mm. this precarious situation? Yeah. Yes, it, it is. Yes. Um, for example, in Mama Amazonica, I put my very mentally ill mother and abused mother in the Amazon rainforest, which also is raped and abused. Yes. And, it, and, and it, it, the two together, for me, make, uh, 
show just how precarious the the, mm. the forest is and yeah. um you know the fact that it, it, if you look at a clay lick where, where the macaws come to to the clay lick uh, and, and you can see where where the um the roots are off off the trees above it because they've yeah. eat, eaten all the cliffs away and it's so thin it's a tiny thin felt um and you know and, and those are our lungs some of our lungs mm. on the planet so mm. so yeah. um yeah so just to clash the two things together and also yes. you know the the one the woman and the child so those with less power I think yes and yeah as yeah. nature as nature seems to well I don't know maybe nature actually has more power who knows who knows what's going to happen <laughs> who knows but yeah it's it was a really uh oh just spot on compatibility melding those two stories together and and they kind of give each other more power to tell their story by being integrated and and you mentioned earlier about well I didn't I don't think you use the word but I'm using the word healing almost of of mm. your relationship with your mum through writing that collection and, and re yes. writing this story to have some compassion there and I wonder if in any sense it gave you some sense of healing of the natural world of this place that you feel so deeply that destruction of too mm, yes because it it gives the natural world human um feelings yeah uh, and the fact is that i don't really know what a tree is i don't really know i can't get into the head of an animal um so it's just one way of doing it really mm, gosh yeah uh, yeah, I, it's interesting. Yeah. I, I was just going to say that earlier you said about childlike. Yeah. Um, because I, I'm it may be that my love of um the planet, if you like, comes from living with my grandmother in oh. and this was in Wales. Yeah. This is my Indian grandmother, but but she lived in Wales and she brought me up for, for most of my childhood. And she had what was to me a very large garden. I'm sure it wasn't that large now, but it seemed to be. Yeah. And it was a quite a primitive council house with no plumbing or anything like that. Um, but and almost everything we ate came from the garden. Oh, wow. And uh, and I, you know, I, I look back on it and I think that the lawn was my savannah. Yeah. And the shrubbery was my forest. Gosh, yeah. Um, and because I'd gone there from Paris, where I was very unhappy before I was seven. So I, I, I think it was the contrast to absolute. He was a place with loads of animals. Mm. And I think I really felt, fell in love with animals there with my grandmother. That's amazing. So, so it is a, a kind of childlike thing that I've probably... Yes. Um, kept gosh that's so perhaps. yeah how interesting that yeah that recollection of of how how this has formed up this particular the two places have met your childhood and nature and and how they then are playing out intertwined a bit and what what a huge change to go from the streets of paris to wales and a, a small garden or a big garden in your memory yes and that's yeah, yeah. do you remember straight away feeling a safety or love in in that natural environment there yes mm. yes i do because in fact i'd been there when i was a baby mm. until i was two and a half mm. so not long okay. after i was born i was with my grandmother right. and then i was taken back to paris from the age of two and a half to seven yeah. um and so it must have been i didn't remember but it must have been a, a return yes you know and the fact that my grandmother said uh, where well, she had lots of cats, and there was one called Tibby. And I said, why is she called Tibby? She said, you named her, because you couldn't say Tabitha oh. <laughs> when you were a baby. Oh, that's <laughs> lovely. So there was, yeah, hidden familiarity there too. And I wonder, because mm. 
You then wrote your, your most recent collection, Tiger Girl. That is very much going yes. back to the roots of your grandmother, back to India. And and was there a familiarity at all when you went over to India on these trips to to research to have a look? Did you feel anything yes. of your grandmother? That yes, yes, I I did. I did. I I really loved it. Actually, I loved the people. I loved the forests. I loved everything about. Um, Obviously, it was incredibly hot during the summer <laughs> uh, and so on. But I just loved all the I, I had no idea that there were so many birds, incredible amount of birds in those forests um, in central India and and in Rajasthan, oh. in Ranthambore, as well as Bandavgar and Kana National Parks. Oh, wow. But yes, at the same time, of course, I learned all about tigers and how they almost vanished mm. um, not very long ago. The Bengal tigers, the, uh, the other types are like the Amur tiger are even more um, endangered, Gosh. even much fewer of those left. I didn't know before I started writing the book because I'd really concentrated on jaguars. <laughs> I'd had this passion for jaguars for years and um, then I turned to tigers because my grandmother used to tell me a story about being left in a tent when she was a baby in the jungle on her own and how a tiger walked in oh, wow. and she didn't get eaten. So so I'm sure that that's what I thought. Oh, yes, I can I can write about her tiger and I must go and see what tigers are like. And it was it was really, really fascinating to see how how they differed from zoo tigers, for example, yeah. how they differed from jaguars, uh, more ferocious than jaguars, definitely. Oh, wow. oh, and uh, yeah. Amazing. And I, I can hear, yeah, in you you're talking about it, I can hear the the thrill almost or the the passion and 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 that makes me want to write even so I think of course of course you came out with so much from that um, and then you've got that connection as well through that personal story and yeah I'm really interested in in how it feels to to then publish something so personal because obviously yes there mm -hmm. is there are the tigers there are the animals there's the fauna there's the forests but there's also you and your story and your family's story that that gets told through yes. these collections that's right yes yeah. so there's I, I i wanted to celebrate my grandmother um i wanted to celebrate the fact that she saved me mm. and that her warmth and her love kind of i'm quite sure stopped me from being total disaster yeah. as a human being yeah um and and I loved her, um, and so I, I I wanted to have that aspect, mm. um, uh, and also to tell her stories, and uh, which were secrets. I mean, she didn't, you know, she didn't tell her children, her her grandchildren, what that she was Indian or half Indian or um, the story of her birth right. or um, yeah. And, and then yes, the story of the fact that when I was 14, I had to go back to my mother. So in South Wales this time uh, and how awful that was mm. for me. So there was the banishment from Eden. Definitely. Mm. Wow. That happened twice. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder as well whether you you using that that term like the banishment from Eden and I noticed that folklore comes up in your work a lot. Is there is there an, an interest in in old folk traditions or religious imagery as well mm. that that helps you to yeah. to process yeah. again? Yes, because um in in fact my grandmother had very few books in the house. She wasn't educated as such um, but um, 
she had a big book of British folklore, mm. in fact, <laughs> which I, I've I've got somewhere, and she uh, she had second sight, but it was a very strong second sight. So she she was clairvoyant. Wow. Uh, she knew when someone had just died before she got the news. She would see them. She would see their ghost. And she would tell fortunes at fairs and she'd dress up as a gypsy and I would go with her. So, wow. so I guess there was a, a, a natural um, environment of the supernatural for me. Mm. Uh, and, and also a Catholic background that I had as well. So so the supernatural and the spiritual were, were there. Mm. And, and the excitement of that, because it is exciting, you know. Yeah. It's a bit frightening as well. She she did used to say that it was actually frightening to have the second sight. Yes. Gosh, I can only imagine. And and it's interesting you're using those words, actually, that, that joy and that frightening fear as well because again in your work I I get both those worlds I get both those feelings like there's a darkness and an intensity and there's also like a real brightness and opening so it's it's as though you can bring that into your words and and weave it into the poems themselves which is quite a feat Mm, thank you (laughs) and you've you've recently won a few quite big prizes for your work has that changed anything for you in terms of how you feel about your writing or moving Mm. forwards um well yes yes of course yes uh i I don't think of myself as a poet with that much self-confidence you know Mm. so um and sometimes poems are easy to write but a lot of the time they're very hard and uh so yeah, to to get the two prizes for for Mama Amazonico mm. was just amazing, uh, and helps definitely. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, and so I've been working on my novel. Oh wow! And that's I I'm on the kind of just yeah, just on the touches of it. Yes, right. But it's a secret at the moment. <laughs> keep quiet everybody that's oh that's so interesting because actually something that I wanted to ask you was about your commitment to poetry because I as a writer Mm. I I dabble in everything and a few of the writers that have come on the podcast have also they do a bit of memoir they do a bit of poetry they do a bit of novel writing Mm. or short stories and Mm. and yet your career has so much been these incredible yeah now eight collections of poetry but now, now you're telling me actually <laughs> there is another strand that comes in. Ah, well, yes. There's the novel which I started writing 17 years ago. Wow. And actually, two of the collections came from it. So, well, oh, I, I and I, I, I won't say anything more about that yeah. because you yeah. know until it's further along, it's best not to. Yeah. Um, but I did actually start out as a sculptor mm. originally. I went to art school. I have six years at art school behind me. And um, I don't have any literary training. But I did al- always want to be a poet. Uh, and at the beginning, I was. I did write some n- little novels, novellas, you might say, that obviously didn't work. This was a long mm. time ago. And then I used to write short stories, too. And now I can't for the life of me think, how on earth do you write a short story? I don't know. <laughs> I feel the same. It's weird. Uh, when I was younger, I could, I would just write them. And now, yeah. yeah. How do you do that? <laughs> now I, because I think I know that people say, oh, it, it's so hard to write a short story. And I think, oh, no, I can't do that. Oh, um, that's what but yeah, what, what, <laughs> when I stopped making sculptures, uh, then the poems got better, in mm. fact, because it's not that I dabbled. I, I was serious. What I would do was I would spend a year as trying to be a poet, and then I'd spend a year very seriously as a sculptor, okay. no, nothing literary at all. You know, I was just a sculptor. Uh, uh, and, and then I'd alternate. It was like two different people almost, wow. except the sub 
the subjects were the same, but Gosh. you know, different media. And um, what what would push you to to switch again? What would make that change happen? Ah, uh, well, I I know that with poems, it would be because I couldn't get better. Right. So um, I would think, oh, never mind. I can make sculptures instead. Okay. And yes, sculpture was very hard hard work for me. I'm not. Physically, I'm really quite weak and very small. So uh, it was, and I was making difficult things too, mm. life size figures and wow. doing resin casting and stuff. Um, yeah. So, so it's when I came across difficulty in one, then I'd switch. Mm. And it was when I stopped making sculptures so that um, I could no longer evade the difficulty i had to work uh, through it wow with, with poems yeah i think that's that really helps that's because yeah. now now yeah now i have to work through it really and how, writing. and how did you decide to finally stop with that sculpting process oh i i think i just decided that it was too hard for me physically right um yeah. i went Ten years, there were ten years in between my two courses, between my BA and then my MA, and I went to the Royal College of Art, which took me wow. a long time to get into. Yeah. But I had a hard time there. And um, there there was one tutor who used to say to me how much better my poems were. <gasps> <laughs> and uh, And I think, yeah, in the end, I just decided that it was easier for me to manipulate metaphor yes. and images in 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 words than to actually mess around with materials. Ah, oh. and so it's yeah, down to that. No, that's fascinating. That for such a long time, it it was, oh, I'm actually better at at the other. I'm better at the sculpting. That seems to be easier. Mm. And then that realization of actually, do you know what? I've got into the place where what I what I actually yearn to get from this process. I'm actually getting or achieving mm. more through the writing. And and when I was yes, reading about the yeah. fact that you'd been a sculptor, I, I couldn't help but draw that parallel to sculpting words, to, to coming up with images and and shaping the words and shaping the lines. And it made me think, oh, it kind of makes sense now why your poetry is, oh, that feels a bit big to even say it, but so perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> There's this kind of yeah, careful no. sculpting of it. No, no, <laughs> I won't no, no, say it. <laughs> but but um, <clears throat> what was I going to say about about it? Um, yeah, I even though I'd given up sculpture, I mean, I, I my whole life had revolved around being a sculptor, you know. So it was I had to do it to survive. Right. So then I really try to put it into the poems so that I made them as solid as I could. Mm. Yet, when I was a sculptor, I worked with transparency a lot. So I made figures that were transparent. Oh, wow. And I worked with, with glass and so um, and thorns and all the things that I have in my poems, but lots of birds. Um, so... I wanted the poems to be solid but transparent. Right. So another thing that I I have consciously worked on is accessibility so that they mm. are accessible as well. Mm. And I think if I make them very physical, yes. that helps to make them accessible, accessible for other people. Yeah, yeah. What a beautiful way of, of pulling the qualities from one art form into the other and and therefore achieving more of what you you hope for or or what you wish to be able to portray and and, and it's something I do really like about and appreciate about your poems because actually for me that's the type of I, I need poetry to be accessible for me to find that access into it I I tend to like I think many people get a bit alarmed when I don't, can't tell what's going on <laughs> and be, and find myself pulling back and feeling like oh I don't have a place in this whereas yours create a pathway in. And then there's huge complexity to them as well, which means that the depth is still mm, there. Th thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's what I aim for: is an easy, easy access, and and then um, depths inside. Mm. Uh, mm. But but it, it it does 
bother me that the readership and the audience well it's more the readership for poetry is so so niche and yeah. so and so many people are put off it yeah. and uh, and you know I, I really love it for example when teenagers like my poems mm. and I think yes you know I've I've reached through to them yes yeah <laughs> yeah and I do hope that there's a bit of a new era of that 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 some what with spoken word and um, new artists using music and poetry that there's a bit more of a sense of accessibility and people maybe not hearing the word and just shying or eking away so quickly but it how did you find it how did you find poetry then and, and not have that fear about starting to try writing it <clears throat> mm, um well when I was at school I heard the teacher read out Keats' Ode to a Nightingale. And I don't know how old I was, I think about 16. And I was a very withdrawn child, possibly, or well, teenager, in fact, possibly on the spectrum, you know. Mm. I was in a world of my own, and I felt as if someone was speaking to me. And I, I loved the organic forest quality of the poem and uh, and the depth of the poem and so I from that moment on I thought oh I would love to to join in this world and try and create worlds mm. with words uh, and so that was the introduction to poetry mm. I think um it was very hard for me to get into it, partly because I was a, a serious sculptor. So yeah. I suppose I wasn't 100 percent, you know, dedicated to it. And also, um, you know, having to earn a living and yeah. not having much money and all that. Um, but back in the 80s late 70s uh, 80s there there were there were only to say two MAs in creative writing right. that existed as, as far as I know and I couldn't do those I'd done an MA in sculpture right. and there weren't there, there wasn't <laughs> there just wasn't the um kind of critical but encouraging workshops that there are now yeah, yeah. so that the, there were one or two that I belonged to but let's say that I was a very slow learner mm. and it took me a long time. Plus, I always wanted to write about the wilderness and in the 80s and probably the 90s, I think um, the urban was what was in vogue. Right. With poetry, if I, if I may say that. <laughs> and so I, I felt that I just I wasn't in fashion at mm. all. I was out of sync with it. So, yeah, but I did, I did stick with it. Which is amazing because it, was it in your 40s that you started becoming established as a poet? Yes. Yeah. Well, well, yes, I, I published my first collection. I think I was 44 right. when that happened or 43. And but my first book, Heart of a Deer, wasn't didn't get any notice. Right. Uh, and then the incredible thing happened with my father and I wrote The Zoo Father, and that got a lot more notice. Mm. And it got shortlisted for, for the T.S. Eliot. Which is huge. A yeah. few other things. And and uh, so that was a bit of a turning point for yeah. me. Were you in a, London a at in the door. that point? Was that, yes, yeah. yes. Does that feel important looking back, that being able to be at the mm. centre of the literary scene when you were starting to put work out? Yes, it, it, it did. It did help to to be in London. Yeah. Uh, although I'm I'm not by nature a very sociable person, but I would go to poetry events and stuff. And at the time too, I was poetry editor of Poetry London right. for many years. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I was kind of part. I knew a lot of people, and gradually I kind of learned how to write. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and established yourself so well it's incredible and and how has it been then moving down here do you are you part of a community of writers still does that still feel relevant mm. or important 
Um, I have been welcomed very warmly by poets in Cornwall, I must say. Uh, I'm, I don't drive and I live out in a very mm. rural location. So I, I don't actually meet up with people. And I am quite a hermit at heart. So, uh, but I, I'm on social media and that's a way of keeping in touch with people. Yeah. Um, but yes, everyone's been really good to me. And even in the little hamlet where I live, they they kind of heard of me before I <laughs> moved here and were really welcoming and and lovely. Oh, wow. What, yeah, what a thing to arrive to a legacy already. <laughs> That's so interesting. I, I'm curious when you were talking about um, the poetry collection, the zoo, the, and how... Um, how that suddenly brought everything to the forefront. And you were saying that earlier about how that came off the back of actually a, a period of block, which so many writers don't talk about. And I know I have experienced that definitely personally and, and often in response to to when big things are going on personally in my life and, and it just almost, yeah, creating a, a physical as well as mental block to being able to write about it and so yeah I'm, I'm really interested that you're open about that and mm. how how that was mm. to go through that and how that shifted yeah and it literally was that day when I was at the little zoo the menagerie mm. in the Jardin des Plantes and I was supposed to go to an event in Shakespeare and Company the, the bookshop mm, yeah. in the evening but I came home from the zoo and I I immediately started writing this poem and I thought, oh, I'm not going to go, go out because this is something new, mm. you know. And and it and although the poem didn't last the it was a germ, a proto poem for for all, all the poems in in the collection, really. Right. They're all portraits of my father and myself. Uh, and through the animals, I was able to say much more than I knew consciously knew about Gosh, what had happened with him yeah yeah it's amazing it's it is funny it just makes me think that it's about and again I, I've had this experience of waiting for a particular image or moment or ray of light that, that suddenly gives them meets the subconscious almost and and starts talking and starts creating that pathway yeah. again to words and to speaking about things through words yeah. it's so st- so strange how that happens mm. because it's how I started um, Mama Amazonica as well. Mm. I was uh, spending time in Paris and I rent a room there. Uh, I rented a room there. I, I don't anymore. <laughs> and, um, you know, at a time, a month at a time. I mean, it's very expensive. Right. Uh, and because it was very expensive too, I would really have to write. I couldn't do anything else. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I brought with me a notebook, a big notebook from Kew Gardens with leaves on the cover. And in it, I had a picture of the Victoria Amazonica lily. And so 20 years ago, I had tried to write a poem about it oh. and failed. And I thought, I wonder if I should have another go and write about And then I started writing about my mother. It just came to Gosh. my head to do that. And, and that's how the, the book was born yeah. kind of thing. yeah. <laughs> so magical <laughs> how these things are birthed. Uh, do you find, do you ever make visual art still? Does, is that ever a kind of, oh, actually, hang on, I'm, I have mm. the urge to tell it through <laughs> this? Or did that literally just move straight into writing? And well, we know it's not straight into, but. Yeah, no. I, at the time, I was doing a lot of residencies in schools. I was doing uh, residencies around the Gaia hypothesis, as it was then, and. Um, so I was helping kids to make art and in, and in fact to dress up as the world's environments and st- stuff like that. Uh, uh, and so there was a transition yeah. when I just gradually stopped. So no, I don't. But I suppose I think if, if I was wealthier and I had more space, mm. I might make little things, you know, mm. I might. And I, and I had a little bit more time. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't make big things anymore. I would make small things. Mm. And 
and so it, so yes there is that other world that I think yes. what if yeah yeah interesting but I still I still collect things though I still collect things as when I was a sculptor natural objects like nests and stuff nests and skulls and are those kind of prompts <laughs> to you for writing because I, I know for instance your poem prize photograph oh. started from a photograph and do, do you find mm. yeah when you collect something that that's a little prompt that you can then yeah. use yeah, so yeah, that's, uh, sometimes there are other people's, a lot of artworks today mm. that prompt me as well, mm. like a lot of paintings, because I was never a painter. Yes. And, uh, and I, I wrote a whole book about, uh, in the voice of Frida Kahlo. Yes, so, yeah, I was going to say. Um, because, I, because when I was at the Royal College, actually, a tutor said to me that his, the way I'd laid out my studio, he said, really reminded him of the Blue House. Frida Kahlo's Blue House. And, oh, interesting. And so that 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 remark stayed in my head, and then I I didn't actually know her work then, but then I got to know it, and then eventually I went to Mexico a few times and oh, wow. walked around the Blue House and the other houses where sh- uh, she lived. And so, yeah, so uh, and then wrote that book, yeah. which was like a bit of a holiday from the other books in a way because – in the other books, I'm usually a child, mm. but in the Frida Kahlo book, I, I'm an adult, mm. a young, a woman, a young woman. Yes, and and that yeah, inhabiting her world so much, and and yet her not being someone that was was necessarily familiar to you. But then there is that mm. real connection through the artwork and and through your arts background, and obviously yeah. a bit of a, a uh, feeling uh, there. Uh, uh, Yes, and, and there was the coincidence of uh, hummingbirds and thorn necklaces and all the mm. things that I'd used. Wow. And uh, uh, But also it was when I read her diary and it was introduced by um, Carlos Fuentes, who said that the bus, when she had that terrible accident yeah. when, she, when she was a teenager and um, the tram that she was in collided with a bus, and a rail went through her vagina, in fact, and she was so wounded from it all. He said she was raped by a bus. And I thought, oh, wow, maybe I can write about rape with there being no one to blame. Mm. So it's not about blaming someone. It's just about how you um, how you survive. Mm by yeah. making art and the wonderful ways that she survived yes. making herself beautiful and making these incredible little votive paintings. Oh, that's such an amazing and, perspective at it. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Surrounding herself with animals as well. Mm. How, how do you then, what's your process? So this is these ideas. We've had a lot about how they come to you and, and the ways in that you then take, but then how how do they start forming into words on a page, and how how do you then reshape them into poems? Do you have a process, or or is it always different? Um, it, it's I think it's always different. That there are poems that I've written almost straight off when I've seen an image, for example, or or a phrase. Yeah. For example, the green bee eater came from the phrase. That, that I saw that an ornithologist said that, that that it sings tree, tree, tree. And I immediately then wrote the poem, mm. you know, because I thought, oh, my goodness, this bird says tree. <laughs> <gasps> uh, and uh, in The Zoo Father and also in Mama Amazonica and elsewhere which will come to light there is the image of the hummingbirds in the suitcase mm. um the straight jackets poem yeah. which started with the straight jacket and that poem was written straight off from seeing the photograph of 40 hummingbirds mm. wrapped up in a suitcase so so it's it, it can be really different yeah um it, there's sometimes poems are very long, have a very long process. For example, the Jaguar, which is the last poem in Mama Amazonica. Um, I started 
I, I knew it was going to be the last poem, so I knew, and I'd seen a jaguar in the wild and I hadn't written about it yet in the book, so I really mm. wanted to do that. And I thought, how on earth am I going to do that? And so I started by trying to write a cento, which which is a poem where you um, collage together lines from other poets that you admire. And and then I came across, um, uh, to do that, you have to, of course, look up all your favourite lines and poets. And I was looking up, references to jaguars and and there was um uh pablo neruda's um like a river of buried jaguars which Mm. comes in his heights of machu picchu and so while i was trying to write the cento which came to nothing that line stuck and that became the epigraph to my poem the jaguar yeah so that was how i did it I'm just so thinking. So you can be back collecting words. Yeah, yeah. In fact, literally, what I was about to say, you've you've just proven it even more. I was going to say you're really going to have to come and see the new writers block when we set it up because so much of what you've just talked about is so attuned to to the processes we do. And actually, we we often have jars of words as one of the th- the prompts that are used in the workshops. This thing of collecting words and and then pulling them out and and seeing what comes from that and using images and using collage and so Mm. yeah it's really Mm. interesting hearing how you also Mm. use these aspects as creative ways in which yeah yeah it's amazing so so with that poem prize photograph which was about that terrible incident of of the elephant calf that got set on fire as it was crossing the road uh, well, I came across that on Instagram because what you know, once I'd left India, then I continued following mm. a lot of the photographers that work with those tigers mm. and and elephants in that in Madhya Pradesh. Yeah. And um, so I came across it there, and then wrote a, a poem based on it, and um, but because I really, really wanted to write about how. Yes, the local pe- farmers um, set it on fire by throwing firecrackers at it. Mm. They, they didn't mean to set it on fire. They they needed it to. They needed the elephants to go away because they're ruining their crop, mm. and they are so so poor mm. that they've got to eat. Uh, and and I wanted to try and say that without mm. preaching, you know, that yeah. that it's a, a very complex business of. Yeah, you know, of conserving animals and forest, uh, as as well as people trying to stay alive. Yeah. So it's finding the story beneath the story, even and yeah, putting that across. Yeah. Oh well, thank you so much for everything you've shared with us. It's been, it's been a wonderful, yeah, wonderful conversation to have. And and before I let you go, I wonder if I, I ask every guest this: what. What would be your perfect writing day if I could gift you the perfect writing day right now? Oh. What would it involve? Uh, it involves me sleeping really well, being able to wake up really early, uh, having a cup of tea in bed and starting to write then, um, maybe casting around, looking at um, per- poems that aren't working or um, notebooks and trying to write just with that freshness of Mm. having just woken up before the day takes over Mm. Um, but you know before the messiness of the day and the outwardness of the day the terrible things (laughs) happening (laughs) that bring you down as well Um, so it would be that, and then having breakfast, and then going for a walk, and standing at one of the. I have a standing desk gate, I call mm. it, uh, halfway along my walk, and then I look at my poem there, or else I just look at the woods around the the river and see if I can see anything. Gosh. Um, looking up at the trees again and thinking, what are you? You know. 
and trying to photograph them, but iPhones just cannot capture that mm. depth of field of them. Mm. So yeah, it would be that. Mm. Uh, and then I, 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 I yes, that, that would be the, the writing part of the day. And then I'd have another session in the early evening before dinner. Amazing. <laughs> and I love I love that question. What are you? I'm gonna I'm gonna ask many things that now <laughs> and, and hope to glean some some inspiration from it well thank you so much thank you for your time and thanks for sharing everything about your work and it's been an absolute pleasure to get to talk to you and hopefully we'll get you involved thank you so again. much for for asking me polly thank you thanks. and for your bye. wonderful questions oh. bye <laughs> so welcome <laughs> Next episode, I'll be speaking with Misery Day, an international theatre practitioner. Misery is senior lecturer at Falmouth University in theatre and acting. Her latest solo show, Family Tree, explored themes of identity, melding the personal and the political. We look forward to welcoming you back to listen. Click subscribe to hear when this episode is released and to help us share these conversations with others. You've been listening to the Writer's Block podcast. Find out more about the Writer's Block at thewritersblock.org.uk. Music and sound was by Jimmy Marshall from southwestsonic.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>